So hi, everyone. Welcome to Alumni Week and another Banana Slug Share event. My name is Michael Reapy. I graduated in 1991 from Oaks College with a degree in computer engineering. I'm a volunteer on the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Council, where I currently serve as the past president. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, just a couple of housekeeping chores. If you could hold, hold your questions for the end. Uh, we're going to go for 40 or 45 minutes, and then we'll, we'll hold time at the end for questions. Uh, you have two options uh, if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, one is that you can turn on your camera and use the raise your hand feature. Um, for me, you can, uh, some people, you can hover over the reactions button. Uh, some people, you go into the participants button and there's a little ellipses on the bottom. There's a raise your hand feature there. Um, if you don't want to turn on your camera and ask your question yourself, um, you can uh, just type your question in the chat room and we'll read it out for you. Uh, again, so and we'll, we'll call on you if it's uh, your turn to ask a question. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the wonderful staff who are helping to put on this event. Um, we have Nikki Torres, who's on the university event staff. We have Barbara Odin Petri, who is an alumni engagement staff member. And we have uh, Danny Geralt, who's a member of UCSC Student Zoom Corps. You could uh, join me in a little round of applause for them. Uh, we appreciate their help. Uh, there are over 130,000 UC Santa Cruz alumni who are now spread across the, across the globe. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you one of the most interesting and accomplished of those alumni. Gordon Wiltsey is an author, explorer, and National Geographic photographer. He began his career in the dark rooms at Kresge College and went on to lead and or photograph more than 100 ever-changing assignments to some of the wildest places on earth. The Explorers Club called him one of the leading expedition photographers of his generation, and for more than 45 years, his images and stories have helped to inspire his generation to get outdoors and explore the planet themselves. Uh, his website is www.alpineimage.com. You'll see that on his slides. Uh, so without further ado, take it away, Gordon. All right. Well, thanks so much for the introduction, Michael, and thanks for everybody coming. It's really fun to be back part of the UCSC community today, and uh, I really appreciate your coming. So I might as well get started here. Uh, this is the first time I've... Let's see, how do I get started? I thought I was sharing my screen. Oh, there we go. Sorry, this is the first time I've done a Zoom talk. Usually I talk to people in person, but uh, I'm here to talk. Uh, when I was asked about speaking to UCSC, I thought about uh, my career and what, what was notable about it. And I think that one of the things I've learned most about in life is the art of staying alive and in all kinds of different manners in spirit, body, mind. Uh, and okay, I'm a kind of an expert on it. I've done more than a hundred expeditions to different corners of the earth and written a book about it and been to some of the wildest places on earth with some of the craziest people and met some of the craziest people. And throughout my career, I've been on the receiving end of people hurling at me in various different kinds of situations and sometimes I've carried that to extremes like here on Baffin Island where I spent two months on this wall and I was often dangling out there in the middle of the space to try to get pictures that really capture people's attention and, and unfortunately in this case it happened to be rather dangerous and something I was very happy to survive but I've always considered myself a participatory journalist, which means I get into the thick of things. I become involved wherever I go. And here in Mongolia, I, I wanted a picture of the, these cattle rushing out of pen, and I well, thought I'd get in the middle of them and I pushed the shutter, my flash went off and they panicked. So uh, there are unknown kinds of dangers and hazards that I have to survive all of the time. Uh, and it often means getting miserable, you know, if you're going to be part of the action, I didn't necessarily take a snow bath every day, but I had to endure the same rigors that the team did as they went along. And, and part of being a participatory journalist is, is really getting in deep, getting to staying someplace long enough to learn the language to or maybe not learn the language, but learn how people think, what matters to them, how do they survive, what's important to them. Uh, 
and you know, get to know people, uh, dig in. Who, you know, here is an example of somebody who really knows about survival and what I learned from these people. In this case, we spent three months living with these people, got to know their names, uh, learned to speak Bengali, uh, and just dove into the situation, which was an enormous, this is one of the most rewarding things I ever did. But there's also not just my personal survival, but places, survival of the places that I love, like Bears Ears National Monument, which President Trump gutted, and I'm hoping that President Biden will reinstate. Uh, and survival of endangered species, you know, with climate change coming up, already upon us, these, these creatures are losing their habitat, all kinds of animals, mass extinction. This is where we're in an area of mass extinction. And, you know, I hope that I, my pictures can help with that. And then bottom line, we're all connected, interconnected. And what happens one place happens another. And it really, our personal survival as human beings uh, depends on the survival of our planet in the way that it's supposed to work. And then another kind, per, more personally, one, one thing I wanna keep alive is the spirit of enthusiasm and youth that I had when I was a student at UCSC, you know, brimming with life and looking for new challenges in the world. And the bottom line always is the challenge of surviving in a business and keeping things rolling, keeping money coming in. And it's not what I love to do, it's kind of what I hate the most. Uh, but it's very important. And working with all of that, I've, I've come back with a remarkable collection of stories of which I'm very, very proud over the years uh, and all over the place. But if you look at these pictures, you can see that there's danger involved in almost everyone. And even the animal picture down there on the bottom, it's a rattlesnake. I mean, I, I don't know if it's something about my personality or what. But it all started at UCSC, or it all came together at UCSC. It didn't start there. And, and I actually came into UCSC as a transfer student from another college because I, it I grew up in California and it represented to me the spirit of California, the spirit of our times and flexibility. And, and it was the 70s and the 60s and things were changing. And Santa Cruz was hip to that unlike my previous school, Amherst College back in Massachusetts, which gave a far more traditional education. But, you know, it really wasn't for me. I, I admire my classmates. I treasure the deep knowledge of the classics and things that I learned there. But at the same time, the art teacher told me that photography is for only for people with no talent. And it, there weren't a lot of people like me. So I wound up taking a year off and I traveled I uh, bought a VW van, drove 20,000 kilometers through all kinds of different countries and lear really learned how to live on my own and how to, to get starting, take chances, start immersing myself and, you know, learning about the world around me. I, I really uh, grew up a lot on that. I did Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz just fit the kind of person I was, who I wanted to be, living closely with the land, down to earth, kind of hippy dippy, you might say. Uh, uh, you know, I, I already had a fair amount of experience when I got there, and, and I, I think kind of think that I was born into this life. Uh, my parents were both extremely adventurous, took us along on some often very miserable trips. Uh, and I suffered so much as a kid on some of our fun camping trips to the edge of nowhere that when I started mountaineering, it seemed kind of easy. And I grew up in a spectacular place, Bishop, California, due east of here, due east of Santa Cruz, in what I consider the most beautiful landscape in the world, which I saw that from the time I was born. And certainly it affected how I grew up. In fact, place matters to all of us. And notably, I had started climbing and in, already met a National Geographic photographer when I was still in high school. Galen Rowell up in the left, he was considered the Ansel Adams of our generation. And uh, at this point, when I met him, he just got bought his first Nikon, but he was already famous in mountaineering circles and would go on to shoot a cover story for National Geographic and many other stories. But 
I know I loved being at Santa Cruz. There were so many, just the ambiance, the excitement of this proximity to San Francisco after growing up as a small town. Uh, and I, I pondered when I got there, I pondered what am I going to study? I actually transferred in with a biochem degree, but Santa Cruz encouraged me to stretch out my thinking and you know pursue what I, I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was go to Kathmandu and Nepal and wild places like that. And sure enough, my first quarter at Santa Cruz, I learned about an ind independent study program offered by the Experiment in International Living back in Brattleboro. And I changed my major. I'd, I'd taken this very inspirational writing course from Jim Houston, one of my professors there. And I, I took a photography course. And I changed my major. No way I was going to study, study organic chemistry in Nepal, but and it, this turned into a very wonderful experience. And this was true immersion and learning. I lived with this family for four months and they didn't speak a word of English. And so just to get through part of the study program was learning the language. And I, I today it's the only language I could just pick up and start speaking. And, you know, I remain very close to this family. I sponsored the little kid on the right to come to the United States where he drove a fish truck and made thousands of dollars and returned to Nepal, uh, a relatively wealthy man. And, you know, we Zoom chatted just very recently. So very meaningful experience to me that had two parts to it because I also really wanted to go deep into the Himalaya and start trekking. And so this was an opportunity. I did two treks while I was there, one of which was to the Kumbu region at the base, near the base of Mount Everest. And I actually climbed my first 20,000 foot peak there. Here's a Sherpa that came along with me. He, he'd never climbed a mountain before, knew nothing about it, but here he is on the summit firing up a cigarette. And then, but the most surprising thing about that trip was when I got home, while I was gone, one of my friends had sent a stack of my pictures into the one of the first ever adventure travel magazines, the Mountain Gazette. And by the time I was home, they put one of my pictures on the cover, they put my name on their masthead. And I was so excited because this is exactly what I wanted to be doing and just fueled the fire of my creative time and the rest of while I was at Santa Cruz. I spent months in the dark room. I mean, hour, 16 hours a day at times, uh, cr creating these, all of these are pictures that I shot while I was at Santa Cruz or created while I was at Santa Cruz and went on to be some of my very first widely published work in bigger magazines, including my senior thesis about living with a family that was my first published article in, in a magazine anywhere. Well, the most important thing that happened to me at Santa Cruz was uh, meeting Meredith Nelson, uh, on a, I was actually leading rec department trips and we doing a ski touring trip to Yellowstone, uh, to Yosemite and she was along and well, one thing led to the next. And I guess I put her through my a survival test of my own as we got started here. I invited her foolishly to go on a four day ski mountaineering trip in the Sierra Nevada for, uh, across a couple of high passes. I didn't realize she'd almost never skied before, uh, that her boots didn't fit, that her heels turned into hamburger. Uh, I thought she'd never ever talk to me again, but lo and behold, we actually got married um, after graduating from the university. We had a dream together. We wanted to travel the world and take pictures and bring back things to show to the world. And, and we thought, well, it'll be easier if we get married. And then sort of maybe in revenge for uh, my, my test of her, she arranged a way for us to get to your, to get a free round trip ticket, so to speak, if we would spend three months working in a refugee camp in Bangladesh, uh, which would get us over to where we were going to go. And lo and behold, we walked into one of the great survival experiences of, of my life, witnessing these people who many of them had been wealthy and middle-class people and due to the war in, of independence in Bangladesh and a cyclone that blew ashore with a tidal wave, hundreds of thousands of people had been killed and the country was absolutely on its knees. 
And I would have to say the time we spent there was one of the most remote, more rewarding times of my own life. But our real dream was not to spend our time in Bangladesh. That was kind of how we paid the dues. What we really wanted to go was trekking in the Himalaya and meeting the mountain people who lived there. And right along those lines, uh, just before we gotten married, I had been invited by Will Hurst, who was the, uh, there was a new magazine coming out but to be published by Jan Wenner at Rolling Stone and its editor was Will Hurst. And he had read the story, my senior thesis in Mountain Gazette and went, hey, and he invited me to join, to be a contributor to the magazine. And there's one of my pictures in the first ever ad for Outside Magazine. Uh, so we took this quite seriously and we, we went looking for stories, just the two of us bumbling around. Here we, we spent a month uh, trekking around Annapurna. We were amongst the first people ever to do it. Fortunately, I did speak Nepali. We, we had a porter who didn't, a Tibetan porter who didn't speak English, was kind of scared. But, you know, you can see us tricked out in the latest gear here. Uh, but a magnificent experience, really getting us in touch with the landscape there. And, you know, talking about survivors there. I, I wish at 80 years old that I'd look like the guy on the right. I actually did come back and give him a portrait of that uh, a few years later. Uh, but the most exciting part of the trip was stumbling into this pilgrimage when 30,000 people from all corners of India converged on a cave, crossed two, on a four day trek across two 16,000 foot passes, people of all walks of life in order to visit the cave where Shiva is said to have imparted the secret of immortality to Kar Parvati, his mountain consort. Uh, well, it was an astonishing event and wound up, we came back with our story for Outside Magazine and was very excited about that. But, you know, we came back from that and we still had to make a living and I made a little bit of money out of the magazine, but, you know, it was going to be a while before I could start making, actually making a living and, and just to survive. I had to do a variety of different kinds of work, fixing my own car, building houses, but most important was I learned to guide, I knew, because I knew how to travel in the mountains, I learned how to teach other people to go there. And, and through the auspices of the Palisade School of Mountaineering, which is in the High Sierra and Mountain Travel, which is the first ever adventure travel company, I was opened a world of, door, a world of doors for me, uh, especially the Palisade School of Mountaineering, I both had to learn and teach just the meticulous details of staying alive in dangerous places and always thinking, keep or staying mindful. What am I going to do if I move this here? What if I cook over the kick over the cook pot? Uh, and it gave, and most of all, it gave me an opportunity to go places few people have been before, take pictures, and that was kind of a twofer for like mountain travel. Not only did they get me leading trips, but I was giving them pictures to sell their business with, which ultimately led to uh, the mountain you see in the background of this picture, which uh, Mount Borunse, it's near Mount Everest. It's in the shadow of it had been climbed one time in history by Sir Edmund Hillary back in the 50s. And uh, the leader of the expedition was a doctor who had set up an emergency high altitude clinic below Mount Everest and had been invited to climb Everest and wanted to be trained, wanted to learn how to go about it. And so he concocted an expedition of my good friends. And it was a real experience in learning how to fund something like that. The many things we had to do, I got in touch with Canadian Club and convinced them to pay us thousands of dollars to hide a case of Canadian Club at the base of Mount Everest, which is rising up there in the background. I got another assignment from outside to search for the Yeti. Uh, I led a trip for mountain travel after the expedition. And we probably, but the most successful thing we did was to raise money and which you know, for was a really worthy cause was we taught a climbing school for Sherpas. You know, that sounds like selling refrigerators to Eskimos or something like that, but not really. A lot of these guys in the pictures 
uh, in fact, several characters in these pictures had climbed Mount Everest. They had climbed other big mountains, but nobody had ever taken the time to, to say, this is how you rappel safely. This is how you clip into a rope. This is how you cross a glacier. And so we were helping them to survive uh, as we were, you know, and I really loved that period. And I'm actually still involved with teaching Sherpas to climb through, the, through a foundation that now operates an annual climbing school there. But the climb itself proved to be way more difficult. It was this, we, none of Peter's pictures showed that cliff on the right there, that's like 70 degrees steep with overhanging rock bands and things. It was, took us three weeks to get up there. Well, forget skiing, Hawaii. Uh, just getting up, it was gonna be a challenge. And we spent about 10 days trying to get that high. And then from a high camp, uh, set off for the summit and we were going great guns until about a hundred vertical meters from the summit the wind kicked up and blowing 90 miles an hour sideways actually actually the same wind killed expeditions it was the close of the climbing season all of it and so we had to debate well how badly do we want this summit and we realized we don't want it that badly, we'd rather survive and come back to do it another day. We don't want to lose our toes and fingers and whatever else. And even though it was a defeat, it was a, a big success. Not only did we survive, but it convinced me that I could do really exciting, new and exciting things by myself and that there was, that I could make things happen. And it, it very inspirational to me. And we came home with two great stories, one in Powder Magazine about climbing the mountain, the, the Yeti story, <coughs> and a wealth of pictures that we use for a variety of other things over the years. But the thing is that all of that paid for the expedition. It paid for a wonderful experience, a wonderful six months in, in Nepal, but it wasn't paying us to rent a house. It wasn't paying us to you know make a living. And, all this time, my parents had started this math book company and wanted us to join them as partners, you know, get a real job, son. It's time to grow up and face the music. And we did. For two years, I did this, but uh, both Meredith and I did this, but our heart wasn't really in it. And I kept leaving for different jobs. I went off and guided a 22,000 foot mountain. And, and my parents, as keen as they were on adventure, they were not happy about climbing, which they thought would would kill me. And uh, so then this big commercial uh, came to town, uh, making a TV commercial for Sanka coffee so that people wouldn't get the jitters climbing, which is pretty funny because most climbers I know drink triple espressos instead to get, but as a consequence of that, my parents fired us. I mean, it was just okay, enough is enough. This isn't working for either of us. So Meredith and I started our own little company, Alpen Image, which, you know, we just, we did everything we possibly could, including carpentry and uh, guiding to get by and make a living. And sometimes it was were wonderful, glorious assignments like for travel and leisure in the desert. But I wrote a lot of stuff that I really didn't like at all or didn't enjoy doing that much, but it paid the bills and I was good at it. You know, reviewing hiking boots or the 10, I wrote the first 10 best trips for Outside Magazine, which I've ruined to this day. I just, uh, 10 best places that were about to get ruined. Uh, and then, you know, using my, the pictures I took for other things or did by caught by accident in different ways called stock photography. And I did a lot of advertising, uh, you know, for outdoor companies, for, for uh, ski magazine, equipment pictures, boot companies, and, you know, in a bit of, you know, you got to do what you got to do. I even shot an ad campaign for the U.S. Army after having while at Amherst protested the Vietnam War and the Mayday riots and seemed a little hypocritical, but I did have to pay the bills. And, but the real thing that kept us going here was my relationship with the ski magazines that kept me working most of the winter and sent me a lot of exciting places around the world with very interesting people like Franz Klammer and many others. And it forced me 
to get technically more proficient. And if you're doing a story about skiing for a magazine, they don't just want pictures of people flying on the slopes. They want to see what it's like at the resort. Why would people want to go there? And it forced me to learn a lot about lighting. You know, there's even artificial lighting in the picture on the right there. Uh, and all of which would help me later. And it also taught me a really important thing about adventure photography, which I call Kodachrome courage. And I really had to work not to encourage people to do stupid things uh, because just to get their picture in a magazine. And it, it was a really fine line. And the picture on the right there, we were shooting a Warren Miller ski movie in Antarctica. And here's Mike Farney's about it's his career and his job to make a jump like that. But I mean, I was also the guide on the trip and it was like, wait a second, what are you doing there? We're 1700 miles from the nearest hospital. Uh, if the plane could fly and if the weather's good enough, you know, you could die if you crash. But I, you know, it was worth it to him and definitely worth it to me. But what really started to change things was when our son Ben was born. Uh, 1983 or so and you know it was even Meredith is his point was you know it's time to get real you you've got to get get more traction here you got to be doing bigger jobs and so she bought me a coat and tie and an airplane ticket to what I thought was the scariest place on earth which was New York City uh, and it was an eye-opening trip and I wound up making many more in the future and I I did meet people I met photo agents and I met uh I rekindled relationship, met some of the magazine editors, but I also met a lot of people that just their whole career was how to say no. And I heard so many, one of the guys in high up in one of these buildings stood in front of his window and, and swept his arm and said, do you think those people down there care about that? It's the worst idea I've ever heard. But at the same time, I, it encouraged, reconnecting with ski here a meeting with ski they decided to send me to Kashmir, india which to photograph a funky little ski area there very odd and uh, part of the british raj but what i really the reason i really wanted to go there was that this gave me an opportunity to fly over there at the expense of the government of india and take two friends for what i really wanted to do which was cross country ski across the malaya over the spine of the uh from Ladakh to Kashmir, which was like a 70 mile trip. Uh, it seems pretty extreme and out there. Nobody had ever done this before. And this would wind up being the first expedition that I put together myself and led. And it didn't seem that far fetched. I, uh, earlier in my career leading trips for mountain travel, I'd hiked up the same valley. Uh, the people raised sheep there, people lived there. Uh, they all cleared out in the winter, but it seemed totally reasonable. But everything takes on a different tone in the winter when things freeze solid and it turned into a huge epic we got pinned down by storm so we couldn't turn around and go backwards and then we hit a place that it, where there was a beautiful trail and sheep can walk four abreast in the summer but here it was avalanche terrain uh, icy uh, it, it was a very challenging uh, experience it only seemed to get worse and finally uh, I mean we were getting lost. We had maps. It's illegal to have a decent map in that part of the world in where India is fighting with Pakistan and their border country. And we realized that the, the contour lines on our map crossed. The, it was gibberish. Uh, we almost got lost until finally the day that we were hoping to ski all the way out to civilization over the last pass we climbed up. Uh, we were stopped all of a sudden by a cliff that we couldn't see from above. And it was quite daunting. And we, we climbed into the top of the gully there on the left. And all of a sudden, an avalanche set off. And we didn't go with it. But we thought, oh, thank goodness, we got that out of the way. Uh, and, and you can see two pairs of skis, if you look closely, jammed into the gully there. Well, we were having, we had one rope and one ice axe. And they'd lowered me 70 feet down to sort of the narrowest part there where I chopped out a platform and waited for Alan to come down. When all of a sudden, and there was just this 
why are they kicking off so much snow? And this avalanche came down from high above Lunstorf, some 20,000 foot peak and funneled into this gully and we just went flying. Uh, I wound up, uh, I thought I was paralyzed for a while. Uh, I mean, it's a long story that, that uh, panned out badly for me. Uh, I did wind up breaking my two, crushing two vertebrae on my back and having an epic rescue where we, we lost skis, I lost my camera, uh, just to get ourselves out and back to civilization. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, it had been a beautiful experience and it, it, it yielded me a story in Outside Magazine that would really launch my career that people at National Geographic would see later in later years. And up to this point, I thought that my career was going to be all about the Himalaya. I spoke like three or four different languages there. I was dedicated to the people. I was sympathetic to their ways of life and their outlook on the world. But, you know, things in the adventure photography world, things come as surprises. And out of the blue, I was invited by Leo Laban, the founder of Na uh, Mountain Travel. I'd written a nice review of one of his trips and it's a reward. He said, hey, I've got this empty, uh, empty berth on a boat going to Antarctica. Can you get an assignment and be, can you get an assignment and be down there in two weeks? Well, my passport had just expired, but I managed to do it where I was introduced, I thought Antarctica was going to be big and fat and boring, uh, horrible place. And I was astonished to find that it was far more beautiful than I had ever imagined. And teeming with life in, in all kinds of different ways. But the one thing that bothered me was I couldn't get out and spend any time there. I mean, for good reason, in trampling penguin colonies and polluting you know, very sensitive areas need to be carefully regulated. But what I wanted to do was get inland and climb some of the amazing mountains that I'd heard there were there. And a year later, I got a chance again, when because of my experience in Antarctica and as a guide, I was introduced to Adventure Network, which is a fly-by-night aviation company started by some guides and a bush, a bush pilot to fly big wheeled aircraft into the center of the continent, landed on bare ice. Uh, the, the landings were uncanny. It was so dangerous and such a business risk. And they lost all kinds of money, but they wound up opening the entire continent to private expeditions, which had never been welcomed there before. This was the private paradise of scientists and they really didn't want people intruding. Uh, and, and for good reasons, we do pollute the place, we might need a rescue and such, but, you know, it turned out that over the years, Adventure Network has rested the, uh, rescued the NSF far more than the other way around, well, they never have, but uh, we'll talk about a different landscape and new challenges to survival and new horizon, I've never been in a place so deserted, so quiet, and, you know, I wound up coming back, I ultimately went, thir made 13 trips to Antarctica, seven, uh, eight, nine of which were flying expeditions to put off into places nobody had ever been. And some of them on, on growing little bitty assignments for National Geographic, including climbing the highest mountain, 16,000 foot Mount Vincent on the continent, <clears throat> skiing. Uh, I joined this group for four days. They, they were the first adventure travel group to ski to the south from the coast to the South Pole, 55 days of staring into the wind. And they invited me to go the whole way. And I, I made it four days before I uh, politely opted out and went on to other things. And then, you know, a couple of years later, I was back on an even bigger National Geographic project to photograph Will Steger epic trans-Antarctica expedition, 3,700 miles from the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula to the opposite side of the continent via the South Pole. And this was going to be one of the last dog sledding expeditions in Antarctica because the peace treaty out, the new treaty protecting Antarctica had banned dogs because of the damage they did in, in to the wildlife there. And But all of it was taking me places, some of which places nobody had seen this view before. I don't think anybody had ever seen this view, climbing in the highest mountains of the continent. But you know, one of the most rewarding of that was 
I got hired by Adventure Network because of my guiding skills, but also because Life Magazine would hire me to do a story about Norman Vaughn, who'd been a member of Admiral Richard Byrd's flight expedition to fly to the South Pole in 1929. And Norman had been as part of his dog sled backup team, rescue team. And so Byrd named the mountain to his right in this picture, Mount Vaughn. And it had been Norman's dream his whole life to climb that mountain. And it was only after Adventure Network made that possible that he got a chance. And uh, it was I could have climbed the mountain in four hours. It took him 10 days. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, it was a massive achievement for him and it, very hard. We, we, made this, we made the summit on the eve of his 89th birthday. Uh, and here and you can see a picture of uh, us on the summit trying to light, light sparklers for his birthday cake there. The wind was blowing so hard it blew them all out. So. And logically enough, as long as I was working in Antarctica, it seemed kind of natural that I would also turn my attention to the North, which I did, and I made 11 different trips up there, but I'll get back to them later. But one of the biggest challenges of the North is it's the opposite of the South. It's an ocean, not a continent, and it has land predators, including the the polar bear and as endangered as they are, you're an endangered species if you're out there with it without a gun. And this is quite the picture here. These, the guy in the picture is a friend of mine who was part of the uh, Danish army patrolling the coast of Greenland. And here a bear came rushing. He'd been in the tent, a bear, his friend who's out tending, tying up the dogs yelled get the gun and he came running out the gun misfired he grabbed another gun and just as it was upon him he shot and killed the polar bear uh which was tragic and nobody wants to do that kind of thing but then he almost got arrested for killing the polar bear by the 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 government uh because he shouldn't have been doing that until they came up with this picture that said, yes, we should be doing it. And to which the response was, how come the guy was taking the picture and not shooting the polar bear? Um, and anyway, but my career diverged. Uh, I got my first major feature magazine assignment for National Geographic to go to the southern tip of South America to a landscape where few, I don't think any mountaineers had ever been before and very few human beings. It was some of the worst weather on earth. And, you know, the landscape, uh, the leader of the expedition had been down there earlier and spent 45 days barely able to even see the mountains. Well, this, we spent 55, 60 days there, 55 of them were terrible, but that's what it took to take this kind, to get this kind of picture uh, and my first big story in National Geographic which naturally enough, if you're good at expeditions, they'll send you on another one. And before the Cordillera was even, even begun, I was already sent to the deepest gorge on earth with a famous mountaineer and writer who, and but this expedition went south in a hurry. It rained the whole time. We were beset by leeches. We uh, wound up eating, we saw leopards there all kinds of dangers and, and we got into a race with this other explorer who wanted to be in there and I wanted, but I had no control over it and I didn't have the money and we'd never spent any time to look at the view or appreciate the cultures we were, we were in. And you know, I got back to National Geographic and they actually fired me, which I thought would be the death of my career. Well, but fortunately I was record, rescued by Will Steger, who had done the Trans-Antarctica trip earlier. And he wanted me to go, I well, said he knew me, he wanted me to join him on an expedition across the Arctic Ocean from Russia to Canada via the North Pole. And I trained with him for several years and he insisted, National Geographic wanted the story and he insisted if we were gonna do that, I was gonna be the photographer, which, it was a wonderful expedition, a whole new shift in paradigm. Uh, it was just the beginnings of the internet. We sent up daily dispatches about the dog. I even sent up a 64K photo to a satellite that they were able to download several days later in Washington, DC and ran Wedding Square in National Geographic. Um, 
but and you couldn't these days you could never do it again but uh, danger was all over that the arctic ocean is perhaps the most dangerous place i've ever been here a 1600 pound sled is broken through the ice at the north pole and is about to sink the sled and I'm meanwhile going, oh, I got to help pull on the rope and Will is yelling at me, take pictures, take pictures. So uh, it wound up being the opening spread of the story. But what Gordon? this encouraged me. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I was just going to give you a five minute warning and then we'll do some questions. I think I'll take 10 45. minutes. It'll be 10 and then we'll do. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, and I really, it, it was, I had to learn to tell stories in all kinds of different pieces, uh, not just the dramatic climbing pictures, but what was it like, all the storytelling elements, which yielded me my first cover story on Queen, uh, in the magazine and led to another expedition up north in the opposite extremes, 4,000 foot overhanging cliff on Baffin Island, which took us six weeks to get up. But this, I was getting sick of this. I woke up every morning wondering, am I going to survive this day? Uh, and, and it was a turn into a media circus. These were sponsored climbers who were paid to do this and needed to get their pictures in magazines. And it, even though we made the summit, I was burned out on this. I just really didn't want to do it anymore. And I, so National Geographic sent me on some something that was supposedly safer that I actually wind up calling the curse of the mummies uh, in which they were, a scientist was looking for the world's highest Inca mummies in the background of, on the mountain in the background, the third highest mountain in South America, a God forsaken place where I got up to 19,000 feet and all of a sudden get altitude sickness. We rushed to altitude. I went into cerebral edema and a coma for a while. I barely survived. And when I got back, x-rays showed that it was caused by a major deficiency in my lungs called vanishing lung syndrome. And I thought my career was all over. But it was, and at the same time, just after that, my Alex Lowe, my partner in so many different expeditions, had been killed in an act, killed along with a photographer his photographer on an expedition I would have joined if I hadn't been laid up by my injury or by my illness. So I was trying to do much safer things at this point. And, and but of course, I, I just did archaeology to send me back to another. I was afraid to tell anybody. So I kept doing these kind of things. And we went down and discovered these cliffside tombs where they protected, where the ancient Chachapoyan culture protected their dead. And it was a great, we, we found a lost city and all of that, but there's nobody who hates each other more than archeologists and that's their paleontologists and rival archeologists trumped up charges of grave robbery to us. We almost got arrested in the country. I was detained by the police uh, for grave robbery, but ultimately we were let off and uh, not even with a warning. Uh, and leading to other stories, in, but survival still had, I mean, here will I survive this day? But the best thing about that assignment was I finally got to start photographing people and they published the pictures, which led to probably the two dream assignments of my life, which were one to Mongolia accompanying a six week migra uh, migration over high passes, 5,000 people and 100,000 animals. And another story about reindeer, a vanishing herd of reindeer herders that live on far Northern Russia, where we spent a week learn, accompanying these people, learning how they live, documenting what was probably one of the last migratory visions that they would ever do, and which they were really only doing because their mothers never wanted to leave their land. But I was going through big changes. My health was deteriorating living in Montana at a mile high elevation. And ultimately I moved back to California, very close to Santa Cruz in Montana, just north of there. And continued very different kind of work covering environmental issues, uh, stories about the coastline and science stories, completely different things that were not dangerous. And, and it gave me a time to reconnect with 
the world around me and learn why I wanted to go out in the first place. Just the magic and beauty of where we are, where we are, when we're there. And, and, and our new opportunity to join a community and become a real person doing real things. And at the same time, realizing the importance of the interrelatedness of our planet and our life and the need for me to do more myself to start protecting that against so many obstacles that are out there, pollution and environmental destruction at the hands of modernization cultural change through materialism and consumerism. Who am I to say that these people don't deserve motorcycles and TVs it's just like I enjoy those things, but the world is changing and with you lose, lose something for everything you gain. Like this is the picture of Namche Bazaar in the Himalaya before, while I was a student at UCSC, this is the same picture 10 years ago, completely different. You know, it's sacred spaces like the Patala. This scene is gone. The prayer flags are gone. The big buildings surround the Patala. And, you know, it, it, we, climate change is the worst of all that's happening to us. Species are going extinct. The desertification, forest fires, starvation. And But what do we do? How do we convince people who in this polarized world, how do we convince people to change, to, to bother to care about the planet? Well, I think the way is through journalism. And that's what I've tried to do. One of my proudest moments was when they went to re renew the Antarctic Treaty back in the 80s, they used, they sent, National Parks Magazine sent this cover story of mine about Antarctica to every senator the, to the, on the day of the vote. Uh, but it's a mixed blessing because at the same time, some of my pictures have, you know, caused change like Bridger Bowl was a little known ski area. It became much more popular. My pictures of the buttermilk help rocks and Bishop in the 50 quietest spots in the U.S. are the 50 spots that used to be the quietest in the U.S. But we need a spark. We need something to get us to change to unify, to initiate the parts of the Green New Deal that it's gonna take or something like the Green New Deal that it's gonna take for us to survive on earth. But uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm, my God, but I come through this whole journey so heartened by all that I've seen in my life and with a new feeling of purpose that I want to continue to prom promote and protect the things that I love and protect and I, sh by showing them to the world and I hope that I'm making people appreciate them and I hope that I've done that for you tonight. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks, Gordon. We have um, one question in the chat from Allison. Um, she asks, how many of your assignments were assigned to you or suggested by you? Uh, it's about 50-50. A lot of the best ones were my idea, but like Queen Maudland, Antarctica was my idea. Baffin Island was somebody else's. Uh, it, it all varies and um, often. I think with National Geographic, most of them were assigned by them, but I thought of a few of them. We have another question in the chat. Which adventures should everyone experience in their life? What about, what advice can you give in telling your stories about those adventures? Uh, I think the kind of adventures that everyone needs to do in their life is to get out and experience the natural world around us and the magnificence of that and the need for us to protect all the different and not only just to get out in the outdoor world but to experience other cultures and you know try to bring back our own impressions of those and the next question from richard what adventures would you do next if you could 
I, you know, I'd actually like to go to Africa and do some more work with wildlife. That would be one of the wonderful things that I would do. And I'd also like to go back to one of the places in the North fall and document changes that have happened up there over the years and, you know, revisiting some of the places and, and bringing more light to what's happening there. Speak up, somebody. Hello? Is there any sound here? Hello? We can hear I you. Hear you. We can hear you. Oh, uh, this is Theodore Said. I'm a UC alumni in Thailand at the present, a uh, retired professor. I was wondering, did you see Dare Su and Sawa, the movie about Mongolia? You, you liked Mongolia. I love Mongolia, and I even learned to speak Mongolian, but Whoa. I don't think I've seen that movie. I've seen some good ones about it, uh, like The Weeping Camel and some others, but uh -huh. I'd, I'd love to see the one you're talking about. There to us, I was somewhat of a documentary about a Mongolian man. It's very touching and memorable. Saw it in Santa Cruz. Yeah, what, how would you recommend somebody starting out? You know, um, the, to what, Starting a if career? They, if they wanted to do work, do something for National Geographics. Well, it's pretty uh, hard to do something for National Geographic, but what I've learned is that you have to have some other skill. In my case, it was guiding and being able to stay alive and keep myself and my partner safe where I went out, which led me towards adventure. Uh, and it was only, and my learning how to travel in foreign cultures, but like their insect photographers are people who know about insects. You have pick something you know about and that you're passionate about, whether it's a place or a thing or a subject. And starting from that, then you, you have the background to intelligently photograph it and write about it uh, in, and some credibility. And that's what really matters. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I was just wondering a little off the track here, what was, as far as annoying, you, you were in danger, but as far as like annoying things go, like airport security, visas, messing with the visas, all the different convolutions in different countries, was that, oh. would you rank that high on the list of annoyances also? Oh, all of the annoyances of flying on an airplane, including excess yeah. baggage. I would go sometimes leave with seven to 10 huge duffel bags, all of which were overweight and try to talk them onto planes, which got harder and harder over the years. Uh, yes. And visas, uh, I was trying to think of some other annoyance that came up. Uh, they're constant, you know, people stay uh, clogging up the airplane. Uh, and I, I thought of one and I just spaced it out. But, but as far as like visas, what was, how did that work? You just got a tourist visa or? Well, a lot of places, I, I traveled most of my time under the radar. Certainly going into China, there's no way you should say you're a journalist because they won't let you in. Uh, and when I went to Mongolia, I did get a journalism permit uh, for that assignment. Uh, in Canada, I've had to get work permits, which is a big deal and a big hassle. Uh, India requires you to do advanced visas. Uh, it can be it can be a real headache, and just when you think you're doing things right, something some other bureaucrat comes out of the woodwork and with a right. new problem. Okay, well, thank you. Very inspirational know, and enlivening. Thank you so much. Are you thank welcome. you, thank you, Theodore. I, I have a question for you, and I'll say everybody just keep your keep your questions coming. Do you have any any favorite uh, professor from UCSC? Your days at Kresge? Uh, 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 Carter Wilson those? was one of my. Uh, senior advisors. Uh, Ken Ruth was a photography teacher. I think he's still there, not at UCSC, but a photographer there. And Jim Houston, who is a well-known writer. He passed away recently. Uh, he taught, was an adjunct teacher that, I mean, he was a huge inspiration to me and encouraged me. Uh, I, I wrote stories about my trips at T to Turkey in his class. And he's the one who said, hey, you know how to write, that you should do something with this. And so he was one of my sponsors for my trip to Nepal. Hi, Gordon, this is Richard. Um, very inspiring things. I have found a mentor myself with uh, Chuck Nicklin, you know, a National Geographic photographer. I was just wondering, 
uh, if you had considered doing underwater uh, photography or training astronauts to do photography you know, for you, uh, would you consider those adventures or training other people to uh, pick up where you've left off? Oh, I, I, I try to do that. I try to mentor younger people coming up. I worked with the National Geographic Expeditions Council, Young Explorers Grant Program, uh, trying to bring other people along. But, you know, I've never, I, I've gotten in enough danger in mountaineering. I didn't need other, other things like scuba diving. And actually with my lung condition now, I, I wouldn't dare do that. Uh, but I, I really admire David Duble and, and Flip Nicolin and all these Brian Scary who that's their world. And it's, and I'm so out of my depth there, uh, but they'd be equally out of their depth if they got 22,000 feet on the mountains. Gordon, we have a question in the chat from Kari. Um, how important has your career, has, how important to your career has writing been? And how do you have any plans to write a memoir? I am working on a memoir. I wrote one, which was to the ends of the earth, but I'm trying to do a more intimate personal one, kind of about the art of survival, very much along this. And this is a step towards that, trying to articulate my thoughts and frame them. Uh, I, but, but writing has always been an essential part. I was a twofer and the ski magazine would send me because they get the article and they get the pictures. They don't have to pay two people expenses. National Geographic did not like to do that because they think a writer should spend all of his time working on the words and writing notes and the photographer should spend all of their time. There are only a few people who did both for them. Uh, but it, it was, I couldn't have made it without writing. That was definitely an essential part of it that I may have downplayed uh, in my presentation. Well, so I, I wish we had more time. Uh, I'm sure we could go on all evening uh, listening to your stories. Uh, but what isn't everybody just please join me in thanking Gordon Wiltsey for sharing his amazing work with us. You can hit that reactions button, give him some applause. Hey, thanks everybody. I really enjoyed talking okay. to you. And yeah, just a few, yes, few yes, more yes, remarks. So I mentioned before, I'm a member of the UCSC Alumni Council. We're the board of directors of the Alumni Association, uh, and we're one of the many groups on campus who are bringing Alumni Week to you. Uh, our mission on the Alumni Council is to support the edu educational calling of UC Santa Cruz, to provide a means by which alumni may serve the university, its colleges, its students, and each other, uh, and to help guide the university into the future. We have many ways for you to volunteer, and to help make a difference in any area that you find most meaningful. To find out more, uh, please go to alumni.ucsc.edu. If I could ask uh, staff to drop that in the chat box. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is that for Alumni Week, we are raising money to support several important causes on campus. We've already raised almost $100,000. Um, and let me tell you about one of them, which is really close to my heart, which is the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Scholarship Fund. Uh, it is our scholarship as alumni. It's a need-based scholarship given to new students or junior transfers with high academic standing. Um, I personally give my time to serve on the selection committee and it is the, one of the primary beneficiaries for my own giving. So you can see that is um, important to me. You can read more about it in the latest issue of the UCSC magazine, uh, as a matter of fact. Over the last 30 years, we've given out almost $2 million to 823 scholars. Each award is for $3,000. Uh, per year and it renews automatically each year that the student is enrolled. Um, and thanks to generous alumni like all of you, this year we gave out 49 awards. One such student you can read about in the article is, is Michelle. She's a junior transfer and first generation college student and she's majoring in applied physics. Uh, she was recently among a, the participants in a project developing methods to detect sulfur and selenium in the Salton Sea. So please make a donation today to the Alumni Association Scholarship Fund uh, to help us give out more scholarships next year. 100% of the money goes to pay tuition and expenses uh, for our students who are most in need. Thank you for joining us this evening, everybody. This was one of 70 Alumni Week events, and the week is only half over. There's still time to sign up for additional events. So thank you once again, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.